All right, well, I think I'll get started here to make sure we have time for plenty of questions from the audience. Um, as we're going through the this this message is to everybody in the audience, as we're going through tonight, make sure to just use the Q&A function down there in the bottom of your screen if you have questions. That's what this is for. We're here to answer questions. I'm assuming you all did your homework and watched the film. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you might even see some familiar faces here. And so anyway, ask any questions you want. Um, for me, this was like a life event. It was like totally life-changing for me and uplifting. And so many people put their effort into making it happen. Um, first of all, my parents who are here, um, they, you know, my first thing when I have an idea like this, something that doesn't sound possible is, you know, I run it by the people around me and see if I can get anyone to say no that, that uh, this is not gonna happen but um luckily that didn't happen and so that's my first thank you just to my my family and my friends um for their support and and i think we all have that here um i also want to thank my teammates sean and Mike and John, Sean is going to come pretty soon. He said he'll be here. And then the crew, you guys will hear from the crew a little more tonight about some of the experiences. But this certainly, the movie and the whole experience certainly doesn't happen without the dedicated crew that really just did whatever it takes. Um and then obviously the filmmakers, uh, Kevin and Nate are here representing the filmmakers. And I think about this all the time, like we would not even be talking about Race Across America, about Friedrich's Ataxia to so many people if it weren't for the film. And um, it just turned out to be such an incredible thing to, to make that trip live on for so long. And even to today, geez, that was 2010 when we did it. So um, <laughs> thank you guys so much. And thanks for being here tonight. Um, I think, so I think the film, the hope for, I think all of us is that everyone can see a little bit of themselves in film. You know, especially the FA community, the British community, but I think it also extends to everyone. Everyone can see a little of themselves in the struggle and the triumph of the film. And um, so just really proud to have everyone here on the call tonight and I am going to have everyone introduce themselves real quick so you can, so everyone can know who's on the call. Um, and I'm going to go upper left of my screen is Kevin. Kevin, hey, I'm Kevin, and um, I'm the co director, co producer of the film. Um, it's great to be here. Again, with a lot of you, it's so nice to see some of you guys' face again. Um, oh, there's Sean Baumstark. Um, yeah, that's that's me. All right, and Kevin is in Seattle with his awesome family. All right, Steve Parsons, you want yeah. to introduce yourself? Yeah, Steve Parsons. I'm currently on the seacoast of New Hampshire. Um, I was introduced to the FA community through my friend Aaron and Bob O'Neill up there on the screen. And through Aaron, I met Kyle. And through Kyle, I made a phone call and said I'd join the crew. And uh, the rest is history. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. 
All right, Aaron and Bob. Hey guys, good to see you all. Um, yeah, we're in Aaron's apartment in Wakefield, Massachusetts. Um, I just, again, I just felt so lucky to uh, been able to take part in this amazing adventure. And um, uh, it just was the most amazing thing I've ever done um, to date. And I, I got a lot of grief from uh, guys like Mike, Mike uh, Andreessen, who gave me my nickname. And then Mike Bryant just gave me a hard time about the bag I packed. So <laughs> all true. My nickname was Mother Hen. Yeah. I love it. And I am Erin. I'm saying Bob's daughter. I was diagnosed that day in 1992 when I was 12 years old. And now I am 41. And um, that's it. We're just right. outside of Boston. Thank you guys. All right, Nate. I am Nate Adams. I'm in LA and I was a producer on the movie. Uh, I did not have the benefit of meeting a lot of these people for the and being a part of the actual race. I came in after it was already shot in like what uh, 2000, like maybe two years after it was already shot and there was a, a bunch of stuff was edited. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with the people in the project and uh, um, did whatever I could to, to kind of help shepherd things to a finish line. Awesome. Thanks, Nate. All right, Paul Conance. Yep, Paul Conance. We're coming from the wine country of Sonoma Valley above San Francisco. Uh, Brianne is my FA daughter. She's She's playing shy with us right now. Hi, Brianne. <laughs> You're saying hi to you, sweetie. And uh, uh, let's see, I was a RV driver. I think that's was pretty much what I did. And uh, uh, it was uh, quite the eight day trip. And uh, uh, it, it's funny because there was actually two trips that I don't want us to forget. Uh, I will mm -hmm. never forget Kevin's mm -hmm. RV. <laughs> and renting that RV uh, and then driving it across the country <clears throat> was not quite as, but almost a, as big an adventure as as the uh, the ram bike ride so yeah I'll, I'll i'll leave it at that the All things right. you don't see on film <laughs> we'll get more into that we'll get more into that yeah from the felicia, night before how about you <laughs> um, felicia i worked at farrah for the last 14 years and i was um i was a gopher on the crew so Whatever the team needed, whether that was chocolate cake or dry underpants, <laughs> that was very <laughs> great. <so high. laughs> awesome. And Mike Andreessen. Uh, I'm Mike Andreessen. I have two sons with FA who are now in their upper 30s. Uh, and so I came into Farrah Dumb uh, a number of years back and was flattered to, uh, to be a part of this team. So. I was the driver most of the time, sleeping part of the time. <laughs> All right, thanks, Mike. And Tom. Uh, I'm Tom Hamilton. I am the executive producer of the movie, which sounds really fancy, which means I didn't do anything relative to anyone on this call. <laughs> um, I was a little like Nate. I came in late to the party um, and just kind of helped organize a few things. Um, I have a daughter who's 17, Annie, who has FA, um, and on the board at, uh, at Ferris since 2013. Thanks, Tom. All right, Mike Gore, Sheriff Gore. Hey, it's uh, Sheriff Gore, not actually Sheriff. Uh, I was the mechanic uh, for uh, Team Farrah. Uh, also, uh, Blake was my personal driver, personal assistant. Um, he did a really good job. 
Um, I fixed bikes. Uh, I kept people dry as best I could. Um, my best friend, Sam has FA. Uh, I think he was diagnosed with, you know, he was 15 or 16. Uh, and so I've been part of the FA community ever since. Um, so after being a mechanic on Ram, I raced it the next two years. Um, so this was my introduction to it and it's absolutely phenomenal. There's nothing else like it in the world. So. All right. Thanks, Mike. Blake. Hey, everybody. Hey, hi. Like, so good to see all of you. Um, I'm Blake, good buddy of Kyle. That was my introduction to the FA community. Um, I think I was pulled in on the project mostly just to be Mike Gore's handler. <laughs> Full time job. And um, yeah. well, somebody had to do it. <laughs> It, all of all of the events surrounding FA have been the greatest of my life. So, but this one was the the crown jewel. So it's so good to see all of you and to, and just talk more about this crazy adventure. Awesome. All right, Diane and Mike Bryant. Hello, everyone. Hi. Yeah. So. Um, we are related to Kyle, unfortunately, <laughs> and he he drags us on all of these adventures. And uh, this was one of the biggest ones, I think. Um, and I was the crew chief in quotes. I think in name only. I think no. Paul was actually the crew chief. <laughs> <laughs> he had to keep pinching me to keep me awake. So, and. Uh, I, I wanted to mention the dance moves of uh, mm -hmm. Blake and Mike Gore. Mike Gore. <laughs> they're, I'm, I'm sure they're uh, they're willing to maybe uh, recreate that dance, and I'd like to see that. Late night moves. <laughs> as long as you guys have a bunch of one dollar bills, I mean, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta pay. <laughs> All right. And mom, was there anything you wanted to say? I, I don't think so, honey. <laughs> All right. All right. Any sorry. questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> and and then last but not least, we've got Sean Baumstark. Hey, hey, it's so good to see everybody on the call and have a few others tuning in. Um, it's ridiculous because as you guys are talking and I'm seeing how life has changed for so many of you. Got kids in the picture, in and out. Um, I'm moved to tears in a sense. And it's ridiculous because we all know Diane and Kyle are the criers here. They're the <laughs> ones that get emotional. But I think just being able to connect with everybody. Just breathe. Just keep breathing. All right, man. We love you too, buddy. <laughs> like so many of you have said, the, the race and the film, probably the crown jewel of life. And I'm glad to be connected with such an incredible crew. I think whether you helped edit or produce or you're on the race with us or you were on a, a sidewalk in the middle of a night in Bemidji, Minnesota, or wherever the hell were you in? <laughs> you, you're a part of the crew and I home is Sacramento and that's where I'm at today and I'm um, just honored to still be a part of the family here. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I actually would like to roll right into some experiences, some stories that represent like a writer's experience and a crew's experience. And so, Sean, I wanted to start with you, actually, with an experience from the writer's perspective. Sean, before you start, just a prompt to the group. Um, the Q&A box 
it, you can submit your questions through there. And once we get um, through a couple of uh, a couple of shared stories from each of the representatives from each of the groups, we'll start moving over to the Q and A's. So just wanted to prompt the people who are watching to submit your questions there. Well, thanks, Alicia. Mm -hmm. By the way, I I feel like everybody probably knows this, but I have FA. Um, <laughs> I think one thing that sticks out to me from a writer's perspective, and there are so many, I cannot wait to hear stories from the RV, both of them, and, and different <laughs> aspects of the ride or the event. But one thing that is sticking out to me recently, just from seeing some of the, the clips resurface on social media, there's one that is one of my favorites. It's, it's funny. Uh, me and Mike Malat, one of the other cyclists, are just sitting on the side of the road under a tree, having a bit of a, what appears to be a picnic. And of course, there's talk about our stupid pills and the uh, supplements we were taking. And although that clay pot thing is meant to kind of add some humor and a different perspective of the race, I can't help but wonder if I was a member of the audience, I would be thinking to myself, why are they just sitting under a tree? Why aren't they, why aren't they pedaling? Or if they're the guys taking a break, why aren't they taking a nap? And, and why are they eating food out of a Ziploc baggie? Like somebody should be taking care of these guys. And so, of course, for me, I just think about why we were there. And although there are a thousand stories on the film crew's RV, <laughs> the writer's RV unfortunately succumbed to some concerns. About halfway through, we were in somewhere in Colorado, and I don't even know what was wrong with the RV. I just know it wasn't available for me to take a nap in. So I got stuck under a tree with Mike. And I think that's testament to the entire race and the entire event and ultimately the FA community, right? We did whatever it took to get to the finish line. Like Felicia said, sometimes it was a run to Taco Bell. Sometimes it was a run to get clean and dry socks or whatever was needed. And I think about all the different people that played a part, whether they brought us food or they went ahead to get the RV service. So we did have some air condition that night or whatever we were up against. It's obvious that although Kyle and myself and Mike and John often get some of the accolades for completing the race, it was not easy for even a crew member. And I know that. And I recognize that it takes an entire team to get some writers from one side of the country to the other. And I'm uh, just grateful to have those kind of stupid memories that, like Felicia said, didn't end up on camera, but that we can find a way to connect on because, well, because we were all there and we remember that peanut butter hitting the fan more than once um, throughout mm. that adventure. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. And Nate, I know that you've got to go pretty soon. Um, and so I wanted to give you a couple minutes from the producer's perspective. You know, you... The film, the film, to let me remind everyone that the film took five years to produce. And um, so, Nate, I know that you were a big part of the, the post-production. And so wanted to give you just a couple minutes to talk yeah. about it from your perspective. So basically, you're blaming me for the fact that it took five years to finish. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. I'll take the heat. I'll take the heat. It's his fault. The whole thing was done. Uh, yeah. and said, this is terrible. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll also put it in the context to try to answer a couple of the questions that have come up, too. So um, the, I, I will leave it to you on the sequel question, though, Kyle. But um, the, so for me, I came in uh, 
like I said, late and, and there was already a bunch of stuff that was cut. Um, and, you know, it was really interesting to see the relationship between Zach, uh, who's not here, and Kevin, who is. Um, and, you know, Kevin shot a lot of this stuff and it was absolutely beautiful. And it's what immediately drew me to the project. The, the cinematography was just incredible. And these shots of them riding through, you know, Monument Valley and, you know, these inc just incredible scenery and beautifully shot. And so, but we, you know, the, the thing that I wanted to try to bring to the, to this, to it was, you know, um, like, how can we, how can we really tell a whole story? And it's, there's so much to tell. And this is kind of always the problem with the documentary is that you end up with, you know, 8,000 hours worth of footage. How do we cut that down into something that's digestible, still tells a relevant story? Um, and, I, you know, I, the, if anybody that knows Kyle or has seen the movie and, or knows Sean, I think the one word that comes to mind is inspirational. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we were focused in that regard. Um, it, inspiration was the primary sentiment. And I've had people say, oh my God, it's so sad. Oh my God, it's so uplifting. But I've had the most of, most of the people that have seen it all say it's the most inspirational thing that I've ever seen. Like it, I mean, when I was spending, when I was working on it and I was hanging out with Kyle and talking to Sean and everybody, I lost like 80 pounds. I've never been in better shape. And then since I've not been hanging out with Kyle and not talking to Sean as much in the last few years, you know, I've gained weight and I'm like, I just I like having that, that level of interaction with those guys and, and the, the mm -hmm. kind of inspiration that they bring to everything is just, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, um, for, for me, my, 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 what I try to do is really bring a sense of story and arc. Um, and one thing that I think pops out to me, Kyle, I don't know if you remember, but we, there's a, there's a line in there where you say, um, I needed to do something that was so epic that nobody could like deny me, the, right. you know, the moment. And, and this was something where it was, it was a structure thing. Like we, we had, the movie was kind of these compartmentalized segments <laughs> and we needed something that kind of launched us into the Ram segment of the movie. And so I was like, we need something where you say like, this is such an, I needed to do something that was so epic. And you're, you wrote it down. And I remember we, you were in Pennsylvania at the time. And, and I was like, I got a buddy who's a recording engineer in Pennsylvania. You guys met up and he recorded you doing that line. And we just edited it into the movie. And that was like the launching point for the whole second act of the movie. And so, you know, there's a lot of little things like that, that I, I think were very, you know, fine tuned, but um, yeah, ultimately, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be happier with the piece and, and I, I love you guys all. It's so great to see everybody's faces and, and, and come back to this with some perspective a few years later. Absolutely. Thank you, Nate. And, you know, like you said, there was 300 hours of film. There was, there was a thousand different stories you could tell, but you guys told the right one. And I think you represent the FA community really well in the film. So thank you. I want to go to Mike Andreessen to give a little perspective from the crew. So, Mike, what, what do you have to share with us? I got one word. It was tense. It was, <laughs> it was very intense. Uh, I think watching the movie and maybe not even knowing the ins and outs of the structure of the race itself. Uh, we all knew what you and Sean wanted to do, which was to get all the way across the country. The fact was we had rules that we had to meet. We had a, a map book and we were told that if you go off of this route, you're in trouble. And it was the crew who were driving and a navigator and so forth who had to take care of all that. I have never thought so hard on a second to second basis of whether I was doing the right thing or not, uh, the intensity was really uh, draining. Uh, so we had this map book. The map, the, the map told us what the elevations were gonna be. So the second thing that we had to do was to decide how, you know, which was the rider who was coming up and would they be able to take this next leg ahead? Is it too steep? Was it an easy downhill? Was it flat? Was it windy, whatever? So, so that was the second huge responsibility just to get these guys from one end of the, uh, of the coast to the other. And uh, again, you know, 
it involved a lot of thinking and we were all tired. Uh, the crews did eight hour, sh eight hour shifts, uh, two shifts in a day. So basically you had two, two eight hour shifts of driving followed by an eight hour shift to do whatever you needed to do, which mostly was sleeping and eating, uh, but was day after day. But the big deal was at any moment, if we got off track, potentially we could have been disqualified. And, and then there was time. We had to be able to make certain time standards. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess one of my recollections and, and to somebody who's casually watching the film wouldn't actually know this, but we were leapfrogging. We had support vans that were carrying a rider resting and followed up and leapfrogged ahead of the rider who was riding. And then they are, their wheels literally had to cross in order to sort of pass the baton. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a very intense eight days uh, and sleeping was difficult. I don't know how many, how many guys I woke up next to who I didn't go to sleep with. Uh, it was very disorienting to say the least. I mean, oftentimes for me, it was Bob and, uh, you know, <laughs> we did a lot of driving together and, uh, and talking together, but so, so in a word, uh, the intensity of this, uh, was huge, was really huge. Yeah. The most intense thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. All right, Tom, from the executive producer's point of view, uh, a few words, if you would. Well, as I said before, I didn't do anything. So, you know, um, this, when I, when we started, this was, was kind of the beginning of my FA journey. My daughter had just been diagnosed within the last 18 months. Um, when I got involved and I think what comes to my mind about the whole project is, um, I, I immediately got to feel community around myself and my family. Right. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't just patients, right. We had Kyle and Sean, we had the riders, but then we had people who have limited contact with FA and these, you know, Kevin and Zach and Nate and people would just genuinely cared and wanted to help. So for me, it was so inspirational and no one had to sell me to like try and help out. You know, Kyle said, Hey, let's go to LA. And we flew out there and I said, I'm in, let's, when, what are we going to do to finish this thing? Um, so thank you for getting me involved because it was really satisfying for me. Um, the other comment I make relative to what Nate said, and he was right, we really had to tell the story and we laugh about it taking five years, but <clears throat> I think what was different about this and it, I think the first cut I saw yeah. of the film was, was two hours and 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason for that is, you know, everyone's so connected, everything was important. Right. Who's making the decision to cut that line out? Who's going to say that that's not important? Like, you know, but at some point you have to say, okay, we can't have Ron Bartek cried nine times. Okay. Let's cut it back to six times. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so those are the, those ultimately, you know, I think there was this level of uh, fatigue that built up over time where we finally were looking at each other and okay, we just got to cut that. I know nobody wants to cut it, but you know, we can't have it be three hours. Right. And, and it brings up an idea. I think, Kyle, what would be very cool, especially for the FA community and people who have a lot of time for this topic, do an uncut version, right? We have a two hour and 40 minute version of this film somewhere, you know, for me, you know, and if you're, if listen, if you don't know anything about FA and you're an outsider, you're probably not going to have a lot of time for it. But if you're in the FA community, it's a good three hour cry, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I gotta uh, say right now, Tom, the film as is makes me look really good. Yeah. I, I don't know about an uncut version. <laughs> John, was really about, John was really about the vanity. He didn't like any unflattering shots. I'm sorry, get that's my bad side. You know, side. Yeah. You know yeah. nothing's changed. You know. So Tom, 
you know, I think one thing that I'll add to your comments is the way we've been able to use the film. Um, you know, we've shown the film to a number, a big number of pharma partners as they're trying to understand FA and get into the community. And we've held fundraisers and we've raised tens of thousands of dollars and, yeah, you know, and it's just idea, enabled. Go ahead. The idea never was that, you know, when we were taught, when we made the film, it was never built to be a fundraising tool. And I don't think that's, you know, that was never the goal, but I tell you what the goal was, was to infect people with the, with the feeling of what it's like to have this disease, right? And, and we went around, I mean, I don't know how many biotech companies we, we got the whole, whole neuroscience departments coming, looking at this film. And you can't tell me those people didn't go into work the next day and work harder in FA. I mean, there's just no doubt. And, and Kyle probably has the numbers. We must have done 25 of these things. At yeah. least you guys, had, I, I wasn't involved in near half of them. You guys did so many more than that. And, you know, talk about getting your money's worth. I mean, if you can actually quantify what that has done to raise awareness and get people motivated, I mean, unbelievable job by all of you guys, really. Well, yeah. thanks to the Tom, you and the whole film team for making that possible to make it accessible in that way for us to use it as that tool. Because I mean, even, you know, however many years later, like up until last year, there was there were several, like every time there's a new pharma in the space, that's part of their indoctrination, I guess, like that there's some sort of lunch and learn and that they have the film and Kyle and others do a Q and A. And I mean, there's, there's nothing like that. Um, so thank you. We've got lots of questions in the queue. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna dive in. Um, so first question from Rolf Hill and any of the group Feel free to raise your hands on this one. Um, congratulations to all the riders, road support and production crew, awesome effort in production. I'm curious about what happened off screen, in particular the pit stops and mechanical repairs. Well, let's. Um... Those aren't the interesting things. <laughs> I think Paul. I think Paul could talk to the mechanical repairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Paul. Yeah, I think that's definitely a Paul question. <laughs> or these are the bikes. <laughs> I've seen, I think our hold on. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm making my composure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, actually, you know, given that vehicles and mechanics and electronics were going 24 7 uh, without a break, night and day through rain and, and heat and whatever uh, for eight days, eight hours, et cetera. Uh, I, I, I think the mechanics did incredibly well. Uh, I'll just make that statement. Uh, the uh, probably the, the biggest uh, mechanical breakdown, <laughs> which, which resulted in our two riders sitting under a tree was that the generator failed. Uh, and the generator provided air conditioning. And our riders that were in the RV, this is the RV generator. Uh, the riders that were resting in the RV, uh, we could include ourselves, but they were the important ones, had to have air conditioning. And, and this, this generator, I'm trying to think about general public phrase to use failed and uh uh and and here we are the ride is continuing uh it can't stop we have to get to the east coast and and uh, and and i uh i don't remember all the details of my phone calls but i got in contact with the rental company that had rented us the rv and they were resistant a bit. And uh, uh, I was resistant to their resistance. And, uh, uh, and they then somehow told us to go in the middle 
of nowhere. The flipping middle of nowhere. And I don't even remember anymore where that was, but it was the middle of nowhere. And we had to drop the two riders off because the ride had to go on. And we, uh, uh, we drove to this place, which was a junkyard, literally a junkyard that had some kind of a uh, mechanic thing going on in it. And the father-in-law to the owner of the junkyard had had an RV, which I don't know if it caught fire, wore down, whatever, but they had taken the generator out of that RV and it had been sitting on a pallet outside for, I don't know, a year, two years. And we rolled in and <coughs> And they led me over to the pallet and they showed me the generator and <laughs> I could have cried because it was unbelievable. That generator was the identical make model generator that was dead in our RV. Now, I don't even have a concept of the of the probabilities and the chances of that happening. But it was a miracle out of nowhere okay. that, and, 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 and they're an automotive place. So they rolled us right into the shop, slapped the generator in, and then we rolled back and picked up <laughs> our two fellows under the tree and, and kept going. And, and so check my accuracy guys, am I, Am I close on that? that yeah. uh -huh. I was there. I was in the RV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it was, it was a, a, a terrible moment when we discovered the generator was broken. And mm -hmm. it was just an awesome moment when we saw that generator sitting there on the pallet. <laughs> and uh, and the, the flexibility of the team, uh, and, and I, I, by the way, I want to I want to come back to uh, our our wagon master uh, because Mike, you were the wagon master, and and uh, uh, I, I remember looking over your shoulder as you sat in the passenger side of the RV, and 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 you had this tremendously complicated uh, complicated. Uh, uh, not graphic chart of who's where doing what to whom when how uh, in order to keep this caravan moving to the east and in the middle of that we took a detour of I don't know 50 miles <laughs> it was a long way to to do this repair and get back on track and you and you kept this through all that but all the while the race went on. And yeah. all the while the race and the racers went were on. moving. Wheels rolled, riders were transferring. All you guys in the in the in the 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 uh, SUVs were making it happen. Uh, I, it was an incredible teamwork effort on those eight days, eight hours plus. So thank you, Paul. Yeah keeping people moving. Um, the next question, Mike Gore goes to you. What did you do to uh, keep Kyle from like getting wet for the spray from underneath? It's, it's captured on camera, but I'm not sure people can appreciate what that what was going on there. So that was the next question that came up for keeping riders moving. Yeah, so Kyle was kind of being a grumpy goose. Um, I think we were like right between like West Virginia and Mount Airy, Maryland. Uh, it was it was pouring down rain. I remember, Blake, I bet you remember this because we were like just running over frogs on the road because there were all these frogs out in the middle of the road. And we're like, are those frogs? Should we go around them? And there were just so many we couldn't. Um, but Kyle sitting down on his trike was just getting absolutely soaked and didn't have a fender. And so, you know, I'd gone to the RV. I think I went to sleep or something like that. And somebody comes, hey, Kyle's getting wet. And I was like, okay, yeah, it's fucking raining outside. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, yeah, what do you expect? Like, it's, it's raining. 
Yeah, yeah. No, no, his <laughs> butt is really wet. It's like, okay, yeah, he's sitting like two inches from the ground. Like, yeah, his butt is wet. So I went out and talked to Kyle and he was like, we were at the point in the race where you just want it to be over. Um, and so I was like, all right. And so when we were in South Indiana, we were riding around this little loop and um, this woman came out when we were stopped waiting for Kyle to catch up with us and brought us out a Tupperware of cookies. Um, and so I stored those for me because Sean and Kyle had enough food. They can take care of themselves. <laughs> Um, and so I kind of put those in our van. I was like, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and so I reached into the van, I pulled the top off the Tupperware and I used a screwdriver to make four holes in it. And I used zip ties to kind of mount this like jerry rig little fender, um, on the backside of where his seat was. And it actually worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was like the most mechanical thing I did the whole trip. Like you know, I got everybody's bikes ready beforehand. So nothing broke, which was my main job. But I think that was like the, you know, other than flat tires and stuff, that was like the, the most mechanical thing that I did during the whole trip. Otherwise I was just, you know, in a car next to Blake singing poorly to songs dancing at Sean and dancing. You know, yes. Dancing. Selling inappropriate. Yeah. Things pass I, I think yeah. at the time Mike kept playing Katy Perry over and over again. So I yeah. think we were more on a Kings of Leon kick, but then Blake was mopey about that. Cause he had just broken up with a girlfriend and he was like, this is our song. And I was like, all right. <laughs> hey so. guys, guys <laughs> mention, uh, mention <laughs> the, the significance of that uh, music that you were, you were playing the music out of the RV, I'm sorry, out of the uh, SUV to the riders through the speaker, right? Yeah, we uh, kind of uh, hijacked a megaphone. I don't know why we had a megaphone, um, but we had one. And so we were just kind of, uh, you know, when Sean got really sassy um, and we needed to kind of cheer him up and, you know, simmer down the anger and simmer up the motivation, we would just play whatever we needed to to cheer Sean up mostly. That's that's the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, cut from the same cloth. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Those were, we got a few stories from the road. Kevin, I want to bounce it back to you and just get your perspective. You know, you were there through all of this and trying to shoot everything and um i felt like got a camera on me 24 hours a day it probably was very close to that actually but anyway just a little perspective from you shooting all this stuff yeah absolutely um first i gotta send everybody a uh, love from one of my best friends and co-conspirator zach who was supposed to be here today he wanted to be here but uh schedule didn't allow him to be here. So uh, hi from uh, co-director of the movie, Zach. Um, but yeah, and so Kyle, you told us to come in here with one story. Uh, it's impossible, man. I don't know. Um, so if I start talking too long, just seriously cut me off. But um, so I'm going to address my, I have a theme. I don't have a specific, specific story, but um, a theme is just how many stars had to align to for this, this thing to actually be completed and come about and it starts with uh so you mentioned this was 12 years ago now that we started shooting this and um the first thing i chalked up to is just we were like 22 years old and i you know i met you and i was living with zach and i went over to zach and i was like so this is the most incredible story i've ever heard let's you want to make this movie with me and he said yes and uh, we didn't think about the logistics at all we just <laughs> said sure let's let's do that and then uh <laughs> i moved up to northern california and started uh basically moved into your house and started filming you 24 7 and um that, that's a specific story the very first so um the very first thing that was ever shot is if you've seen the movie it's the footage the very last few shots of the movie um where kyle's kind of putting his socks on and putting his helmet on and that was the very first thing we ever shot in Kyle's garage. And I'm in there like setting up all these lights and Kyle has no idea what's in. He's like, okay, like. It used to be the opening. It, and one yeah, of the yeah, that used to be the, the opening, opening of the movie. movie. That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's, and yeah, the movie has changed so many times as Tom and Nate have, um, <clears throat> and they say they didn't do anything, you know, they, that's, they did 
Yeah, exactly. And, and Zach too, I was more of the, <laughs> they were more of the specific story guys that really cut it down from the three hours to the, uh, to what it is now. Um, and it's really such a tight, um, cohesive story and it's just great. And, um, I do have to specifically, so speaking of things we cut out, it doesn't necessarily make up for it, but I think I saw Sam Bridgman here. Um, if I had any, I don't know if it's a, regrets, I guess, um, a major part of the movie we cut out was all of Sam Bridgman. <laughs> we had an incredible <laughs> interview with Sam and he was a big part of the movie. Sam doesn't even know that, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I hope we actually can, that's a great idea too. Maybe we'll release that um, because there's just, it's just how do you, yeah, you're trying to tell one story and when you have a whole nother story that's just so incredible, sometimes unfortunately just doesn't, doesn't work. Um, we got, we got one of our researchers at University of Pennsylvania, Ian Blair, he said that a director's cut would be amazing and it would be really motivational to, to all the scientists out there, so. Yeah, noted. Well, that would be yeah easier than than part two, which is also in the cards apparently because Kyle seems to be embarking on another insane uh, <laughs> adventure in in July, um, which is it. Um, that's another story. But um, so I feel like I have to address Paul's um, little RV uh, comment. I'll say to Paul directly, <laughs> sir, you're glad you didn't have to drive that RV is uh, what I'll say to Paul, um, because it almost uh, killed every one of us. And, um, <laughs> more than once. More than once. Um, so, the, so a lot of these stories, a lot of people at the film festivals we took the movie to heard all these stories. I feel like um, the community is, is um, a lot of people who never heard these stories deserve to hear the most. Um, because yeah, it's just so crazy. Um, so this whole thing should be a, a commercial for RVs.com, essentially, because we rented an RV on Craigslist and it was just the worst decision of the whole production. We rented a, whatever it was, 32 foot RV, um, turned it on once, said, oh, this is great, love it. Um, and then <laughs> it broke down probably 25 times. Ram, Race Across America has a, as a technical checkpoint for all the vehicles um, going on the race. And, and um, we wouldn't have passed the, the inspection if we hadn't have fudged the Zach's up in the front seat, like clicking the turn signals yep. on and off. Yep. Cause it actually didn't work. Um, what about the tires? <laughs> I would, the tires all had to be replaced before, um, before we left. We were in Oceanside um, at 3 a.m. The night before the race, which started at what, 8 a.m. or something, and we realized that, uh, I don't remember what, no, the electrical, says, the tires all had to be replaced because they noticed that in the inspection, they said, these tires can't, won't fly. Had to get all the tires replaced. Um, we, we turned on the RV for some reason, tried turning it on, didn't turn on. Um, somehow determined, maybe it's Paul, that it was an electrical problem. We, you know, got in the phone book at 3 a.m. and started calling, cold calling. Uh, mechanics and finally found someone in Temecula, which is, I think, hours from Oceanside. Um, some guy, unfortunately, I don't remember his name, um, drove out to Oceanside, got there at five or six in the morning, fixed the RV, which um, entailed him telling us that we, it was on now and we could not turn it off ever <laughs> um and we didn't so we kept it on drove all the way across uh, the country in nine days uh never turned the rv off um that's just uh five percent of it everything down all the way down to the cabinets weren't latching anymore so the whole time we're driving the cabinets are banging and mm. the bed in the back the, the the shocks in the back of the rv were gone and so try and sleep, go over a tiny little bump and you just like fly 10 feet up in the air. Uh, it was a mess. Um, big, big props to, yeah, so it was myself and Zach um, co-directing and then some of our best friends were the camera operators and, and drivers of the RV. Um, Travis Edwards, Zach Matcham, T. Moore and Greg Boone, um, all 
were just incredible. And Zach and Travis were the only two people driving the RV. They, they for nine days, they um, somehow managed to stay awake and switch back and forth. Um, just the two of them, 24 hours a day, driving in this huge RV, which they'd never done across the country. Um, and to end that story, the RV actually on the way back from the race completely died in uh, Oklahoma, I believe, to the point of no repair. And so we left it, actually ditched it and rented a car and just drove home. Awesome. <clears throat> oh my. Yeah. Many, many, I think I heard a story about it started raining and all the water <laughs> rushing in through like the creases right. in the windows, right? And right. you guys had to pile all the film equipment <laughs> on the table. That was, so that was in Kansas. That was yeah. in Kansas. And I thought Kansas was pretty mild. I'd never really been across the country. Mm. Turns out Kansas is absolutely brutal state um, for a number of reasons. <laughs> yeah, amazing. <laughs> flat it is. You just can't. It's just so flat. But um, yeah, it started pouring rain. The scariest lightning I've ever seen, and yeah, the the seal around the windshield was was uh, deteriorated apparently, and just water was not leaking, just pouring in. Yeah, yeah. We had to yeah find shelter, um, and yeah, stash all of our hard drives, and awesome. that's another. So the one other thing I want to mention. So just the last thing is, um, in terms of stars aligning, is is how fortunate we were with the help we had. So like I said, it started with just me and Zach. And then um, that tended, turned into all of our friends kind of helping us for free on, on the whole trip across. And then um, that kind of turned into, um, when we started editing, uh, one of Aaron O'Neill's best friends, uh, Sarah DeWitt was introduced to us and she was a crucial part of the editing um, process. Sarah came in, she had just moved to Los Angeles, which is where we started editing. and. Um, she came in and sat with us through <laughs> a new baby and like her whole life being crazy. And she just came in for, for little to nothing also. And just for hours every day sat and sorted through footage. And, and that turned into um, Nate and Tom um, getting involved and just really helping us uh, finish the edit and uh, wouldn't happen with all these people. So, um, and the community now just, people watching it and spreading the word and putting the film out there. It's, you know, it's a community. It's, yeah, it's amazing. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. All right. I want to go back to the race. Um, and I wanted Steve to explain to everybody kind of how a uh, transition worked on the road, just to kind of give an idea of what that looked like. Because, Steve, you witnessed many of those out there. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the way it started is you'd have – depends on which riders, too, because Kyle had to have a van behind him the entire time. Um, but one van would pull ahead of the other van with um, one of the riders in it. And then you'd have – so you'd have to have – you'd have to stage one rider miles ahead of – the, the back rider and um depending on the terrain you would like uh, mike andreessen was saying you would be looking at the map book finding spots on the side of the road where you could pull a van over some parts of the country the roads are narrow um just finding ideal places where you could actually safely pull over um have like depending on which rider it was having which how many miles you could have each rider ride um and then once the actual transition took place, you would have one rider's wheel passing the other rider's wheel. And then it was basically getting the bikes in the car, getting that rider in the car, and then getting some nutrition in them, getting them to relax for a little bit, and then having that van leapfrog ahead of the next rider and just doing it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And, and that's actually the middle of the night thing where Sean is is pedaling and pedaling and pedaling. And that was a goof. It wasn't intentional. It just, we, we couldn't make uh, the effective trade-off. And so he had to keep going. And that was a necessity to keep going. 
regardless. It yeah, was everything from, it was making sure they had sunglasses, making sure, I know going up the Rockies, I took the coat off my back and gave it to, uh, to the rider because he needed, he was too cold because we didn't realize it, at 14,000 feet, it gets kind of cold. And then um, basically did what you had to do. And um, I remember even charging batteries for cameras and making sandwiches and, you know, you did what you had to do to get people across. Beautiful. All right, we've got Felicia. Do you want to cue one up? Yeah. Well, just a quick question from earlier. How um, and just to something Steve and Mike had mentioned, how the rules committee handles getting off the route. And I, I'll just answer that quickly. You you get you get penal if you get found out that you're off the route, you get penalized. So you have to go back and you know pick up where you left off. Um, and we did get um, a time penalty. Anybody who, Blake, do you remember why? Because uh, I'll throw it to you if you remember why. Otherwise, I'll give you a different question. Not at all, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can answer that question. All right, Bob, yeah. <laughs> so that was the part of the uh, trip that Blake and I were in when we pulled into that post office, I think, in Virginia. And Jack DeWitt and his family and Jen Farmer and her family were all there and a bunch of other families were there and Kyle come riding in and and it got very emotional when he, Kyle was sitting there with Jen's little boy behind him and it was so emotional um, that Blake forgot to call in the time station. Oh. I was driving. Oh, it was Blake. Oh. I said somebody Blake forgot. Is in that, <laughs> right? so, the, so our, our operation was the van that was ahead on the road would call to verify the the, the number, the time uh, number, T426 number. <clears throat> well, we were out of, uh, we were in the middle of, I don't know where we were, but we had no cell phone. Anyway, getting to the point where we got, um, and we didn't find out that we were being penalized until the last leg to the finish line. And Ram informed us that we were being penalized 15 minutes for being 15 minutes late because Blake didn't call in the time station. <laughs> and um, that was fair, the first I time. Don't know if it was Blake. <laughs> it was Blake. Look at the, he's in the he's in the van with me. Okay. Um, I'll take the fall. Anyway, <laughs> um, so now this for the first time at the end of the race, uh, the first time that we didn't clap mm -hmm. for the Australian team that we've been clapping for each other the whole whole week. They they put, put past us and um, they're going to win the race. Well, we put our two top riders out. I don't know who went first, John or Mike. Whoever it was, caught them right away, and the next rider blew them away. And then we got close enough to the finish line. And we put Kyle on the road to finish the race. But that was that was my story about that. So just for just for Sorry, Blake. real fast, guys, I'm gonna. I just found a photo from. Uh, so, uh, from time station 26 to 27 from Platt, Kansas to Mays, Kansas, I found Blake and I's, uh, photo of the book from that specific route. And it was a 76 mile route. And you tell me if you can make anything out from this, because it is just an absolute mess, all the mileage adjustments and everything. So I'm just going to throw that in the chat right now to everyone. So, <laughs> Uh, please, yeah. awesome. I mean, are you able to blame the? Are you able to blame the mess on Blake also? <laughs> no, no, no. Blake is, Blake's way too pretty to blame anything on. So I'm just gonna. So I just threw that into the chat, and so that's one of the pages. I mean, this book was probably two inches, two or three inches thick of just paper, and so you can see all my chicken scratch on there about going to a railroad crossing, do a four-way stop, adding miles, subtracting miles, time. Uh, go 17.5 miles to turn left, bear right onto Mays Road at 0.3 miles, traffic light, exit, turn left under this because there was a water reroute because it had been raining so much. So uh, if you can make yeah. anything out of that, that was about two hours of our life. And this was a seven day, 14 hour race. So have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, riders, were, the riders were totally unaware of any of this. So they were just depending on us. Turn here, you know. Or you got to go five miles more. 
or and luckily you, luckily they were always hit really calm if we went out for out especially sean just kept a cool head about everything <laughs> yeah so, yeah <laughs> exactly i don't i don't think that was true <laughs> really oh. awesome um all right we have a question here from um a young fan of the film in Super awesome. I am 10 years, his name is Graham. I'm 10 years old with FA and I have to use a wheelchair. How do you pedal if your legs do not work? And Sean, I don't know if, I mean, I can certainly speak to that. Um, and so I don't know if you wanted to take take I'll, that first. I'll, I'll start and I'll let you take over. You you have way more experience than I do for sure. But Graham, in the film, you see me on an upright bike, and I have since transitioned to a recumbent trike, just like the one Kyle rides in the film. But even on that, I recognize that some days my knees want to bang each other or some days it's still a struggle. And depending on your ability, I would say a recumbent track is actually a lot easier than you might think, especially when your feet are able to clip in and be attached to the pedal. It actually gives you a lot more control than you might think you are, you might have. But I would also say, you know, I've seen other people like our friend Sam that we've talked about more than once. He has since transitioned from a recumbent bike to a hand cycle. And I've seen this kid move. Uh, Sam is a beast. And although when you think bike riding, the traditional image that comes to mind is people riding a two-wheel traditional upright bike. When when our minds are made up that we can go somewhere under our own power, Graham, I would say you can ride a bike a hundred different ways and maybe a recumbent bike might be a good fit for you. Maybe a hand cycle would be a better fit, but it can be done. I believe that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Can I just, can I just say something? Can I say something, Kyle? That Please. A message to Graham. I just wanted to understand that you know, this disease manifests itself in different ways with different people at different times in their lives. Some people get diagnosed very early and tend to be a touch more uh, advanced than others to get diagnosed later. I just want to say to them, you're not underperforming anybody if you can't ride a bike. It has nothing to do with you. Sean and Kyle could ride a bike because they were on set a little later in life and everyone gets dealt different cards, but I don't want you to feel any less than anybody on this call if you can't ride one because we all do things differently and it all comes at different paces and you're still a great kid and keep at it. You're going to figure it out. And we're working our butt off to help you. Just stay in there. You know, I, I do want to add something, Tom, and I think Tom will help me make this a reality if you ever need to, Graham. But if you need somebody to tow you or to piggyback with you on a bike, I think I think we got you. We'll help you across the finish line. Yeah. Um, whatever, whatever route or race you have in mind, we can help. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. No, I agree with all of that. Um, and sky's the limit, as we can see in the film. And it's just a matter of getting the resources and getting the friends to help you get there. So this question I want to direct to Blake. It's from Frankie Smith. And the question is, uh, how, how good were the friends, the crew, how good friends was everyone before the ride? And how did the, the race help everyone become more connected? What do you think? That's a big one. Um, 
You know, I, I think something that jumped into my mind during this call that just brought me right back was all of the mentions of the, the support along the way, especially the families that came out to cheer us on. And they were like placed in the perfect position when we all just needed a boost. And um, the, the origin of this term FA family was in my opinion was from RAM and it's something that we may have not experienced before and we may um, you know it may drift in and out of some of our lives I mean for for so many of us for so many of you you wake up it's part of your life it's your daily ritual but for others of us we sort of float in and float out but um, I, I think that it, this is just like such a, a huge question and Kyle, what was, can you repeat that question for me? Yeah. How did the race <laughs> make everybody more connected? Well, also just to draw the point, like Blake was your friend from college, but maybe you only knew your folks other, you know, didn't know necessarily anybody else on the team, but you know, through, yeah, <laughs> through this journey. Yeah. And, and I mean, this was just, this was a journey, but the, the fact that I sort of stumbled into this, like always down for an adventure. Cool. I'll, I'll go across the country. It's a free ride across the country. Um, and as I met this crew, everybody who's on this call right now, and then slowly throughout, you know, maybe I'm in, maybe we're somewhere in, in Utah or maybe we're in Kansas and I'm with somebody new on the crew and I'm talking to them and I'm hearing about their family and I'm seeing how this disease impacts them. And it's, it's just growing in me like the the importance and the significance of of right ataxia the the significance of ram and what farah is doing and everything that they've done since this movie it's like the momentum of this thing is building and it's it's back to what kyle has always said it's just just keep spinning and this thing I think we may have embarked on, I mean, we definitely embarked on something we had no business getting into. <laughs> listening to Paul and the story of like triumph of finding the perfect part in, in a wreckage yard and like makes you realize that there's something bigger happening here. And we all had that moment someplace across the country. We could all go through and tell everyone where that was but the the moments like that they they keep happening and they bring more hope and it's it's just so powerful it's like having this experience in my life having have brought to me by Kyle I would have otherwise just been none the wiser and it's just it's something I cherish and value so much. So thank you all for including me. I'm a perfect example of someone who can be touched by this with, without like actually being affected in my daily life. And not only touched, but you know, in case it's not clear, this is something that's like so enriching to my life. So thank you all for that, for including me. Can I just add Blake. on that real fast, Blake? Uh, so, hey, it's Mike, the mechanic. Um, so uh, in my experience, FA is really isolating. I don't have FA. 
But one of, I think the hardest things about seeing friends with FA, making friends with FA is that um, if, if you don't know people with FA, it can feel really lonely and really scary. And I think one of the best things this did was bring this group of people together with diverse experiences from parents to friends, like friends from childhood, friends from college, strangers, people who just got roped into it, people with FA, people without FA. Um, and it brought so many different people together. And, you know, I called Blake earlier to say, hey, where are you? Are you getting on this thing? And I haven't talked to you in like a couple of years, but you're like, hey, Mike, what's up? Um, and so I think that that for me gave me so much hope for FA uh, and the FA community that it's, you know, we're doing all this great research. Felicia is doing an awesome job. Fair is doing an awesome job. Um, but, you know, there's still people out there. Sam and I were at a hockey game a, a couple of weeks ago or about a month ago. We were sitting next to somebody and I go, Sam, I think this guy has FA. And he's like, I don't know. I don't want to ask him. He asked him, sure enough, this dude has FA. Like, what you have fa and 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 it was this thing where it, it's like everything lit up and you know that's why i want people to see this movie and that's why you know i want people to to know this because maybe there's that one person right now in northern idaho with fa who thinks they're the only person in the world with it and by seeing this they know that there's friends who will stick with you there's family members who will stand up for you there's movie crews who will travel across the country in a broken ass RV and then drive it back across the country to tell your story. And it's a story worth telling and everybody has a story worth telling, especially in the FA community. Awesome, thank you, Mike. And I know that we had this thing, it's uh, till nine o'clock, but um, we went a little over and it's because there's so much incredible stuff about this film. Everyone shared it over the last couple of weeks. And the film has over 8,000 views now because everyone shared it and, and got the word out about the film. So thank you so much. I heard from the producers earlier that the film will be available for free forever on YouTube. So um, please continue sharing the film and telling the story about what happened out there in those eight days and eight hours. And um, thank you guys so, so very much for joining tonight. And uh, thank you to the whole audience for sharing the film and checking out our Q&A tonight. Is somebody going to answer the questions that we didn't get to? If I'm gonna yeah, type Kyle, answers Kyle, Kyle a little sleeps. bit, so if yeah, I yeah, we can we can go down the whole list. If it, it, I'm I'm available tonight, if if everyone's good with these guys up will stay here all night. <laughs> We're used to going all night. <laughs> all right. So this question is for Sean. This is from a guy named Tom Bridgman, uh, and he said that. that my sense is that Kyle, Mike, and John had a pre-race workout protocol. <laughs> Sean, can you discuss your pre-race workout protocol, Regiment? I feel like Tom's put me on the spot knowing full well that I did not have the correct regimen. Um, <laughs> you know, at that time... Not a whole lot of this. In fact, I don't think any of it shows up in the film. But uh, one of the cool things about getting involved about a year prior, I had completely gone through uh, just life turned upside down, complete 180 for me. And one of the selling points when Kyle called me and said, hey, I'm doing this thing. Do you want to join me? It was what better way to come out of the dark and just go big so i'm like oh my god you're right let's do it and to blake's point or some somebody said something we had no idea we didn't think about logistics we just said sure let's do it and that was that's what got me hooked was just committing to something big and you know i was working two jobs i 
my father passed away that year. I was in a weird living. I was just a hot mess. So my plan was to ride every second I could when there was daylight. I didn't feel confident riding in the dark alone at the time. So I would get off work and if there was 20 minutes of daylight, I pedaled. If there was two hours, I pedaled. Um, so what I was lacking was a consistent routine and also lacking in the differential or the variety of routine. I wasn't climbing hills. I wasn't doing a lot of different cycling. It was all just neighborhood. So, you know, I was fine in some cases, but man, the Rockies were a whole nother beast when mm -hmm. it came to climbing. Cause I just, I had never really practiced or trained for that kind of riding. Yeah. But you made it. Yeah. yeah. With your help. All right. This question is going to go out to Mike and Diane, Brian. What were some things after the race that you found yourself missing that maybe you didn't expect? What What were some of the things that, that you liked about it that you're like, oh, I wish we were still doing that? Nothing. Nothing at all. Absolutely that's, nothing. Yeah. that's exactly what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> you have to remember that Diane was stuck in the RV, which was a giant stink fest for eight days, <laughs> making tuna sandwiches and trying to keep everybody happy. She, she didn't even, I don't think she got out of the thing for eight days straight. So, um, and I, me personally, it was like the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. It was a horrible experience. <laughs> Other than looking back on it, I was very proud of myself that, that we made it through. And the, I, I noticed that one, one question on here was, what was the toughest part and how did you get through it? And I, I still remember that I basically had a sleep deprived mental breakdown about maybe <clears throat> six days in and we, and that list, that list that Paul said I had that was all complicated. Well, it was, it was stupid. I was trying to keep, you know, everybody with sleep and some of them weren't getting sleep and I wasn't getting any sleep. And so finally, I don't know if it was Felicia or somebody that said, okay, we're going to pull over for two hours and like regroup. <laughs> and we pulled over to the side of the road and had like a come to Jesus meeting, a kumbaya and everybody you know, kind of got together and refocused and, and off we went. But um, that was, that was really, really tough for me. And I mean, it got to where I, I really did. It was like, I couldn't think I was, I think that the sleep part of it is something that we kind of forget about and something I never want to go through again is that, you know, constantly just trying to push yourself through it. And it didn't work too well for me. Yeah, this one I want to throw in. <clears throat> I never saw Diane sleep. <laughs> I was in that RV most of the time, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I never saw you sleep. Oh, maybe that's you an were accusation, by the way. <laughs> maybe you were unconscious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, I mean, so you know. I remember that bridge we stopped at where we had the little, you know, kumbaya drum circle. Um, it was right by the bridge. It was on the right side of the road. There was a river there. I don't know where, where the heck we were. Um, but I remember, I, so for some reason that sticks in my head, you know, the next year uh, I raced Ram and I was on this team uh, that was mostly disabled veterans. Um, and they asked me afterwards, they said, so, you know, this was way harder than crewing. Right. And I said, honestly, guys, I don't know. I, you know, as somebody who's raced Ram and crewed Ram, I, I don't, there's not one that sticks out as going, this is mentally or physically tougher. Um, there just isn't. It's, it, you know, people like Mike Bryant, Bob, you know, Mike Bryant, Mike Andreessen and Paul and Bob and, you know, every, you know, everyone who was on the crew. And then I don't know how the film guys did it because there were like 10 of us on the crew and there were like two or three of them. And somehow they always had these like great 
booms set up with these cameras <laughs> to capture these beautiful shots. And, you know, it, it's just one of those things where, you know, the sleep does get to you. It really gets to you. And, you know, there are some times where, you know, Sean would light off and I'd go, hey, listen, you know, had a few choice words in there. Get back on your bike. We're not paying you to think. Just get it back on your bike, you know. <laughs> uh, Mike, it, but it's amazing. It's amazing. Mike, you mentioned the beautiful shots and the boom and, uh, you know, Kevin sh setting up shots. And how many times did we all yell, Kevin, <laughs> get in the car. It's time to go. <laughs> we have to leave. I seem to remember like a certain brush fire that may have happened or may not have happened because a carburetor was on some really dry <laughs> in central Colorado. But, you know. <laughs> Well, when I hear your dad's voice, when I hear uh, Mike Bryant's voice, I, I get a little bit of a PTSD because I just remember <laughs> yelling at me. Yeah, we're I going. We're yell. going now. <laughs> get, in, get, in, get in the car. Like, All right. Uh, this question, I think, goes out to anyone who maybe I'll address this first. But the question is, would you do the race again? And I've been asked this many times and i've thought about it a lot and i can't, i think i would if and there's so much talk of all the logistics and everything and if if all i had to do was ride my trike i would do it in a heartbeat but if i had to try to organize anything or pay for anything i would think twice about it for sure so welcome mike. My answer. sorry mike, mike Malot. oh hey, mike Here he is. sorry to tardy to the party i uh this whole east coast time change thing i don't do that very often and I, <laughs> I missed it <laughs> it's all good man mm. we're we're here for you do you want to yeah, the question at hand was, would you do it again, the ride, right? I definitely would. That was... Uh, there you go, Kyle. Yeah, definitely would. <laughs> when, 2023, Kyle? I'm in. <laughs> Sean? Oh, what do you think? Absolutely. <laughs> even, don't even need to think about it. I mean, yeah, yeah let's, let's bring some Adderall for Mike, and we'll call it good. Mike <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, all right. Um, I probably have a few requests going into it again. Uh, you know, unlike last time, we had no idea what we were doing, but I feel like we'd all come with a list of uh, prerequisites if we were going to join the team again. Yeah, uh, we we each have like a writer. <laughs> I'm only doing this if, yeah. If, yeah. <laughs> I don't only know, Mike, I, Ryan, I think we should have cut this call at 9.15 before we got <laughs> to this question or this point. All right, so yeah. on the registration page, so what should our team name be? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Anyone have any uh experiences that were what were your experiences that were most surprising or unexpected and i don't, I'm, I don't think we have enough time for that kyle <laughs> <laughs> mm. mike do you have a experience that sticks out to you just so we can uh hear from you yeah the um there's a couple of highlights for me. First beginning of it, I was so nervous. My stomach was in knots for like the first couple of days and it was like super hard for me to eat. And I don't remember what state it was in, but it was several states deep through the ride that I just turned a corner and the energy, I, I got my energy. And I just remember just like, I got my appetite back. I got energy and just like, like from then on, it was like, all right, like we're doing this. It was awesome. And then just like the, like it got the energy back. And then there was like the two in the mornings where you're just like riding and you're like, what am I doing on my bike at 2 a.m.? <laughs> and just like, this is insane. But then it's just like so peacefully still outside. And you're just like, this is the coolest thing that I'm 
gonna do in a long time. So th those were like the few things that, and then just riding through Gettysburg and along the way, just all the families, like each, like I'm horrible with names, but I just like the, the pictures of the families that met us on the side of the road are just like forever, just like burned like into my mind of like, why we did this and just like the the group behind the whole the whole move um of why we did that and it was just like so touching and even just like i went and rewatched you know the movie again and it was just like man i just getting teary-eyed of just like that like what we did was like really special and i was i'm just like humbled and honored that i was able to be a part of it and you guys asked me to be a part of it and I like it, like the question when I first jumped on, would I do it again? Absolutely. In a heartbeat with you guys, even, you know, a decade down the line and you know, my body a little bit older and more tired, but I'm in. And it's a, it's a like testament to... to the film too, I think, because you can watch it and rewatch it and see different things and at different places have different emotions. It's pretty amazing. I'd, I'd like to throw in a comment if I may. Back to your point, uh, Mike, about the families that came out. Uh, I, I just want to underscore those people. <clears throat> those people came out at all hours of the day and night. I mean, we we pulled in at two a.m. in a in a, an empty gas station, and here. <clears throat> and here are two or three FA families out there in the cold, in the dark, not really knowing when or maybe even if we were going to be there or stop. And they were out there <clears throat> supporting us. And uh, just, just a hell of a testament. Yeah, Day and yeah. night, rain. You know, they were there. I would argue, you know, I've thought about this a lot, that that's what drove us across the country, right? I mean, everyone had one goal, and it was Team Farah. It was FA community 100% all the time, one focus. And yeah, I think we had, you know, little conflicts and our egos got the better of us a couple of times. I know for me it did, but it all paled in comparison to the goal that we had. And we all were very clear about that. So really great. Here's, here's a question that we get a lot because uh, because they were a huge part of the film. How is the family with the young kids, Dylan and Sienna? And um, I love getting that this question. It happens at every Q&A that we've done because they were so incredible. Um, just their personalities came through in the film. And um, Dylan is in college now, and um, he's living away from home. Sienna is in high school, and she's playing softball, I believe, and volleyball, well, probably a lot of different sports. And, um, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that FA continues to progress, you know. Dylan is um, very dependent on other people to help him but his he is the funniest and um <clears throat> most rambunctious i think and he just continues to make jokes and make people laugh and just be an incredibly positive person despite what fa is doing to his body and um, so we, you know, we stay in touch with the Helms family and those two are doing really great, so. And would you, would you want to emphasize that the Helms family is, is uh, fairly unique. Uh, Dylan was diagnosed uh, and, and uh, Sienna was uh, much younger than he. 
um, she was like two years old or something like that at the time. And her parents had her tested and she tested positive for FA, even though she was asymptomatic. And they started treating her with some supplements and stuff uh, at that age, way before she was symptomatic. And, and she is either a one in a million gal, which could be, uh, or because of that uh, very mild treatment that her parents put her on, she is still at 15, largely asymptomatic. You mentioned she's playing volleyball and so forth. It's an amazing story. And uh, if you go to the FAPG information website, under diagnosis, you'll, you'll see uh, uh, an email from them talking about that experience. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. So here, this one's for Mike and Diane specifically. What was your reaction when Kyle told you his plan to bike across the country which time <laughs> <laughs> either i would say well i i think what it was is we knew we knew he was going to do it and so we had to figure out how to help him out and uh i i remember the the meeting we had after um that ram seminar was you and uh, Sean and us, and we sat sat down and said, okay, how are we going to do this? Because the, in the seminar, they went over all the logistics, and it scared the hell out of me. And one of the things they said is, okay, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to have a crew chief. And so I'm sitting there not even wanting to go on this trip, and <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, I was appointed crew chief by these two yahoos. <laughs> And so that's that's the way it started. And then we started training. And um, I remember the, the night ride we did up out of, I don't know, Winters or wherever that was, that, um, that, that first time where we were doing transitions and stuff at night and just what a cluster it was. But um, anyway, we figured out how to do it. You sure I think did. I was amazed by the money that it costs to put this thing on, just to purchase the equipment and to pay for the entrance fee into the race. I, Kyle, I don't know how you did it. Kyle raised the money. $40,000 is what I remember. And I do not know how that happened. It was amazing. What? We I all... guess other people wanted you to go more than I did. <laughs> well, a quick nod to the Van Skoik family because they helped Kyle raise half of that at their fundraiser. Um, yes. And then were, yes. um, were generous that was sponsors. Really good. But mm -hmm. that was huge. They were instrumental in, in funding that trip. Mm -hmm. Yep. Kyle, you uh, want to come out with the last question? <laughs> That's a I, big one. Yeah. Do you guys plan on doing other adventures in order to raise awareness for FA? And I think the answer is probably yes. Um, I will mention that I'm going to be me and well, me and Uncle Steve and uh, my father, Mike Bryant, and a few friends. We're going to be doing a off-road bike ride, a mountain bike ride this summer from July to August, one month. 50% um, of it is unpaved. It's 65,000 feet of climbing in 850 miles. And we're going to be doing it completely unsupported. So we'll be packing all of our tents and all of our food and water and everything we need for the trip. So, um, so the adventures continue. Um, and all of you are invited to come with us. <laughs> no, I'll be home. <laughs> so. Mike Bryant, uh, you look very excited. 
<laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, As always. <laughs> I'll drive the RV. <laughs> Off road. Chains, chains, no problem. <laughs> hey, listen, you guys, we have to we have to get going. So um we're gonna leave y'all, but we love all of you. Love you. All right. Hi guys. Good to see love everybody. you too, guys. Good to see everybody. Thank you, all. Thank you all for being part of the call. Thank you. Thanks, all right. See you all. All right. Bye. Bye.